Hello, hello. Thank you for being here with me. I'm sharing my synthesis and vocal readings of the passages most prominent to me from Alan Watts, the book on the taboo against knowing who you are. How do we relate to what we are, to what we are comprised of? Consider something with me. Each one of us was at one point inside our mother's body and then we were delivered. Our parents are a part of us. Their physical forms literally gave us our physical forms. How about everything that enters and exits our physical forms that we identify ourselves with? The food that we eat, the air we breathe, the sunlight that enters our skin. At what point is it a part of us versus not when we maneuver through what this may be indicating about what we are, what we're doing here, and what that may all mean about life, and then move beyond that and feel what it may be indicating. We may begin to feel ourselves to be part of this greater dance of energy itself that is happening whether we allow ourselves to surrender to the sensation of it happening or not. We may begin to remember how wonderful that can feel. No destination, movement, <laughs> delight in itself, celebration here and now. Without further ado, I'll move on toward the vocal readings from this lovely book. Enjoy. Page eight to nine. This feeling of being lonely and very temporary visitors in the universe is in flat contradiction to everything known about man and all other living organisms in the sciences. We do not come into this world. We come out of it as leaves from a tree. As the ocean waves, the universe peoples. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. This fact is rarely, if ever, experienced by most individuals. Even those who know it to be true in theory do not sense or feel it, but continue to be aware of themselves as isolated egos inside bags of skin. Page 16. God is the self of the world. But you can't see God for the same reason that without a mirror you can't see your own eyes and you certainly can't bite your own teeth or look inside your head. Yourself is that cleverly hidden because it is God hiding. Page 22. If then I'm not saying that you ought to awaken from the ego illusion and help save the world from disaster, why the book? Why not sit back and let things take their course. Simply that, it is part of things taking their course that I write. As a human being, it is just my nature to enjoy and share philosophy. I do this in the same way that some birds are eagles and some doves, some flowers lilies and some roses. I realize too, that the less I preach, the more likely I am to be heard. Page 31. Attention is narrowed perception. It is a way of looking at life bit by bit, using memory to string the bits together, as when examining a dark room with a flashlight having a very narrow beam. Perception thus narrowed has the advantage of being sharp and bright, but it has to focus on one area of the world after another, and one feature after another. I'm skipping over to page 32. We also speak of attention as noticing. To notice is to select, to regard some bits of perception or some features of the world as more noteworthy, more significant than the others. To these we attend and the rest we ignore. Page 47. A human body is like a whirlpool. There seems to be a constant form called the whirlpool, but it functions for the very reason that no water stays in it. The very molecules and atoms of the water are also whirlpools, 
patterns of motion containing no constant and irreducible stuff. Every person is the form taken by a stream, a marvelous torrent of milk, water, bread, beefsteak, fruit, vegetables, air, light, radiation, all of which are streams in their own turn. Page 49. The more one interferes, the more one must analyze an ever-growing volume of detailed information about the results of interference on a world whose infinite details are inextricably interwoven. Already this information, even in the most highly specialized sciences, is so vast that no individual has time to read it, let alone absorb it. In solving problems, technology creates new problems, and we seem, as in through the looking glass, to have to keep running faster and faster to stay where we are. The question is then whether technical progress actually gets anywhere in the sense of increasing the delight and happiness of life. There's certainly a sense of exhilaration or relief at the moment of change. At the first few uses of telephone, radio, television, jet aircraft, miracle drug, or calculating machine, but all too soon these new contrivances are taken for granted, and we find ourselves oppressed with the new predicaments which they bring with them. Page 68. Your soul, or rather your essential self, is the whole cosmos as it is centered around the particular time, place, and activity called John Doe. Thus, the soul is not in the body, but the body in the soul. And the soul is the entire network of relationships and processes which make up your environment and apart from which you're nothing. A scientific astrology, if it could ever be worked out, would have to be a thorough description of the individual's total environment, social, biological, botanical, meteorological, and astronomical throughout every moment of his life. But as things are, we define and so come to feel the individual in the light of our narrowed spotlight consciousness, which largely ignores the field or environment in which he is found. Page 70. Society is our extended mind and body. Yet, the very society from which the individual is inseparable is using its whole irresistible force to persuade the individual that he is indeed separate. Society as we now know it is therefore playing a game with self-contradictory rules. Just because we do not exist apart from the community, the community is able to convince us that we do, that each one of us is an independent source of action with a mind of its own. The more successfully the community implants this feeling, the more trouble it has in getting the individual to cooperate, with the result that children raised in such an environment are almost permanently confused. This state of affairs is known technically as the double bind. I'm on page 78. Uh, this is toward the end of a discussion of the different possibilities for how we may describe the individual, the human condition. There is a third possibility. The individual may be understood neither as an isolated person nor as an expendable humanoid working machine. He may be seen instead as one particular focal point at which the whole universe expresses itself as an incarnation of the self of the Godhead, or whatever one may choose to call it. This view retains, and indeed amplifies, our apprehension that the individual is in some way sacred. At the same time, it dissolves the paradox of the personal ego, which is to have attained the precious state of being a unique person at the price of perpetual anxiety for one's survival. The hallucination of separateness prevents one from seeing that to cherish the ego is to cherish misery. We do not realize that our so-called love and concern for the individual is simply the other face of our own fear of death or rejection. In his exaggerated valuation of separate identity, the personal ego is sawing off the branch on which he is sitting and then getting more and more anxious about the coming crash. 
page 80. Unless one is able to live fully in the present, the future is a hoax. There's no point whatever in making plans for a future which you will never be able to enjoy. When your plans mature, you will still be living for some other future beyond. You will never, never be able to sit back with full contentment and say, now I've arrived. Your entire education has deprived you of this capacity because it was preparing you for the future instead of showing you how to be alive now. Page 104. The fact that every organism evokes its own environment must be corrected with the polar or opposite fact that the total environment evokes the organism. Furthermore, the total environment or situation is both spatial and temporal, both larger and longer than the organisms contained in its field. The organism evokes knowledge of a past before it began and of a future beyond its death. At the other pole, the universe would not have started or manifested itself unless it was at some time going to include organisms. Just as current will not begin to flow from the positive end of a wire until the negative terminal is secure. The principle is the same, whether it takes the universe billions of years to polarize itself in the organism or whether it takes the current one second to traverse a wire 186,000 miles long. I repeat that the difficulty of understanding the organism environment polarity is psychological. The history and the geographical distribution of the myth are uncertain, but for several thousand years, we have been obsessed with a false humility on the one hand, putting ourselves down as mere creatures who came into this world by the whim of God or the fluke of blind forces, and on the other, conceiving ourselves as separate personal egos, fighting to control the physical world. We've lacked the real humility of recognizing that we are members of the biosphere, the harmony of contained conflicts, in which we cannot exist at all without the cooperation of plants, insects, fish, cattle, and bacteria. In the same measure, we've lacked the proper self-respect of recognizing that I, the individual organism, am a structure of such fabulous ingenuity that it calls the whole universe into being. In the act of putting everything at a distance so as to describe and control it, we've orphaned ourselves, both from the surrounding world and from our own bodies, leaving I as a discontented and alienated spook, anxious, guilty, unrelated, and alone. Page 111. If you know what you want and will be content with it, you can be trusted. But if you do not know, your desires are limitless and no one can tell how to deal with you. Nothing satisfies an individual incapable of enjoyment. I'm not saying that American and European corporations are run by greedy villains who live off the fat of the land at everyone else's expense. The point becomes clear only as one realizes, with compassion and sorrow, that many of our most powerful and wealthy men are miserable dupes and captives in a treadmill who, with the rarest exceptions, have not the ghost of a notion how to spend and enjoy money. I'm skipping a bit here. The startling truth is that our best efforts for civil rights, international peace, population control, conservation of natural resources, and assistance to the starving of the earth, urgent as they are, will destroy rather than help if made in the present spirit. For, as things stand, we have nothing to give. If our own riches and our own way of life are not enjoyed here, they will not be enjoyed anywhere else. Certainly, they will supply the immediate jolt of energy and hope that methadrine and similar drugs give in extreme fatigue. But peace can be made only by those who are peaceful, and love can be shown only by those who love. No work of love will flourish out of guilt, fear, or hollowness of heart, just as no valid plans for the future 
can be made by those who have no capacity for living now. Page 156. True humor is indeed laughter at oneself, at the divine comedy, the fabulous deception, whereby one comes to imagine that a creature in existence is not also of existence, that what man is is not also what everything is. All the time we know it in our bones, but conscious attention, distracted by details and differences, cannot see the whole for the parts. Page 157. I presume, then, that with my own death, I shall forget who I was. Just as my conscious attention is unable to recall, if it ever knew, how to form the cells of the brain and the pattern of the veins, conscious memory plays little part in our biological existence. Thus, as my sensation of I-ness, of being alive, once came into being without conscious memory or intent, so it will arise again and again as the central self, the it, appears as the self-other situation in its myriads of pulsating forms, always the same and always new, a here in the midst of a there, a now in the midst of then, and a one in the midst of many. And if I forget how many times I have been here and in how many shapes, this forgetting is the necessary interval of darkness between every pulsation of light. I return in every baby born. Page 